Well, today we are starting a new series that I'm calling New Testament Postcards. See, in the New Testament, there are 21 epistles. An epistle is a Greek word that means letters. So 21 books of the New Testament are letters from Romans all the way through to Jude. Some of them are longer letters like Romans and the letters to the Corinthians and Hebrews. And some of them are shorter letters like the ones to Timothy and Titus. But four of them are one chapter long. And three of those four are the shortest books in the Bible. That's why I call the series New Testament Postcards. Because they're letters and kind of like postcard size. Of course, the inspiration and authority of God's word has nothing to do with the size of the book. All scripture, from cover to cover, is equally inspired by the Holy Spirit, equally preserved without error by the Holy Spirit, and thus equally authoritative in our lives. The four New Testament books we're going to study are Philemon, the two letters uh, from the Apostle John, called 2nd and 3rd John, and then Jude. Not books that get a lot of attention. Can you remember the last time you had a series on Philemon or Jude? But God's word, as always, has a lot to teach us. And these letters are full of God's amazing truth. It's going to be great gleaning big truth from these small letters. Well, maybe you've heard a story that goes something like this. Once there was a young man who lived long, long ago who grew up in a household where he was well taken care of. All of his needs were met. He even had opportunities to expand in the future, become an accountant or a teacher, maybe even a doctor. But the source of his support wasn't from his father or mother. It wasn't from any family member. It was his master. This young man was a slave, born into slavery of a very different kind than was prevalent in the history of the United States. Often their living conditions were the same as their master. They were well fed and clothed, even earning money for their work. Under the law, they even had some of the same rights as a freed person. It was common in that day to actually earn enough money to purchase yourself from slavery. But this young man did a foolish thing. He stole from his master. And such an offense was considered a big crime. A crime that was severely punished. A crime with serious consequences. As the search began looking for the missing item, he panicked. Fear gripped his heart. He knew that if he'd been caught, he'd have to pay a high price. So he ran. He fled. He was going to get as far away as possible. Now the first crime had led to another now he was a fugitive, runaway criminal slave. He thinks that the best place to go, the best place to hide is in the biggest city he can get to. He has to travel under lies and through the night, the many miles to get there. When a runaway slave was caught in those days, they were often treated very harshly. As he travels, he thinks. As he's searching for food, he thinks. As he hides in fear, he thinks, what have I done? Why did I steal? Why did I run? My life was hard, but nothing like this. I always had food and shelter and clothes and even an income. Now I'm struggling just to live. What have I done with my life? Well, when he finally arrives in the big city, it all just gets even harder. And wouldn't you know it, he runs into somebody he knows. I mean, he, he, how possible is it that run away hundreds of miles to the biggest city and then you run into somebody you know? So now he has to lie to cover up why he's there. Uh, uh, my, my master sent me here to, to, and he comes up with the best excuse that he can think of. Some pretty sketchy, lame story. But perhaps that meeting was a, was a great blessing in disguise. Perhaps now he can deal with his guilt. Now he can get past his past and start over again. Well, this acquaintance that he had from his hometown wants to take him to see somebody. 
There's this great guy. I want you to meet him. But he's under house arrest. He's in house arrest. He can have visitors. But he is guarded by and he's chained to a guard at all times. How the young man must have hesitated, right? A runaway slave who had committed a crime going so close to the very authorities that could arrest him might not have been such a great idea. But as his hometown friend tells him the prisoner's name, he remembers hearing that name from somewhere. But he can't quite completely put it together. Well, when they go to see him, he's astonished to find this prisoner is the most free man he had ever met. How can it be, he thinks, I've been running and hiding from the authorities in fear for my life. This guy is not afraid. This guy is so friendly. This guy somehow has peace. This guy says that he's not really in prison. But he's actually exactly where his Lord wants him. Yahweh, Jesus, has put him there. And he shares with the young man all about the true freedom a person can have. The freedom of one's soul from death and sin and hell. The freedom of one's soul to actually live a life with purpose and meaning and hope. He tells them that that freedom comes from a person, Jesus. How Jesus lived a sinless life and how he died a substitutionary death and how he actually rose from the dead. Then he remembers. I remember where I heard about this guy before. My master has met this guy. My master knows him. I've heard my master talk about this man. Talk about this Jesus. The prisoner's words pierce his heart. His fear and his guilt and his pain have added up to such a heavy burden. Hope starts to glimmer in his heart. And then it explodes as he sees the truth of his sin. As he sees the truth of the wonderful Savior Jesus Christ. He confesses and he believes and he's born anew. He feels so indebted to his newfound prisoner mentor that he spends as much time with him as he can. Helping him in every way possible. They become friends. Dear friends. And then in one of those teaching times that the prisoner has, he learns about the importance of reconciliation. And he remembers his past. And then he tells everyone about the real story of how he ended up in the big city. He tells his prisoner mentor that he actually knows his old master. And he realizes under the conviction of the Holy Spirit that he has to deal with his past. He has to come completely clean. The prisoner mentor counsels him, but he already knows what he has to do. He has to go back and face the music. He has to go back to his old master. It's not an easy decision because there could be some difficult consequences. But at the same time, it was not a hard decision because he wanted more than ever to follow his Lord and Savior, to be obedient to Jesus. You see, he's going back to his old master, a different man, a new man. He's going back to his old master with a new master. He's now a willing servant of his Lord, Jesus Christ. His prisoner mentor sends him off with a prayer. Remember your new master, my friend. And he sends him with a travel companion who also has a, has a couple of letters to deliver. One of those letters isn't a personal letter from the prisoner to the runaway slave's old master. His old master, Philemon. The very church in Colossae met in Philemon's house. Epaphras, the founding pastor of the church in Colossae, his acquaintance he met from his hometown took him to Paul. His prisoner mentor, the Apostle Paul, prisoner in Rome. Paul sends his faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, Tychicus, with those letters to accompany back to the church in Colossae, back to Philemon, taking the runaway criminal slave, now beloved brother in Christ, 
Onesimus back home. Well, that's the background. With a little historical license thrown in there, there, to the very letter that we're going to read. The letter from the Apostle Paul to the old slave master, Philemon. Well, please turn in your Bibles to Philemon. The letter to Philemon is actually pretty easy to find in the New Testament. If you can find the book of Hebrews, you just go right before the book of Hebrews, and there you have Philemon. So follow along as I read this letter from the Apostle Paul to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all his saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. Yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but out of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bond servant, but more than a bond servant, as a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. To say nothing of you owing me your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark and Aristarchus, Demas and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Father, now as we look into your word, into this amazing letter and the amazing story, this truth, Philemon and Onesimus and the Apostle Paul and your sovereign will and acts. Lord, teach us, humble us to your word. Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, first, as with all letters in uh, the first century, it starts out with who wrote it. That's such a more efficient way than the way we write our letters, right? Typically, when we write a letter, we don't say who wrote it until you get to the very end of the letter. Look at how Paul starts the letter. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. How Philemon's heart must have leapt with joy when he saw that first word. The Apostle Paul, the very one who led him to Christ, as verse 19 says, the great Apostle is writing me a letter. What a privilege. 
The letter starts off with the name of his friend. The Apostle Paul never made it to Colossae. But when he was teaching for three years in Ephesus, the gospel spread throughout the whole region of Asia. As people from all over the Roman province of Asia, what we would call today uh, the nation of Turkey, came to faith and they came to be taught, taught by Paul in Ephesus. Epaphras, the founding pastor of the church in Colossae, was saved and taught by Paul in Ephesus. Philemon, in whose house the church met, saved and taught by Paul in Ephesus. Of the 13 letters of Paul in the New Testament, the beginning of the letter to Philemon is unique. It's the only time that Paul describes himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ at the beginning of the letter. He was actually in prison in Rome at the time of writing the letter. But he was also actually in prison in Rome when he wrote Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians. But he doesn't start off those letters that way. See, Paul isn't just telling Philemon where he is. He's telling him that he's a prisoner for Christ Jesus. He's telling him why and for whom he is in prison. He's telling them that in the great sovereign plan of God, he is a prisoner for Jesus Christ, for his glory, for his sake, for his purpose. Philemon, as you're in your, your pretty nice house with your family and your servants, I'm chained to a Roman soldier. Never free to leave. Never free to just go out and enjoy life. Always bound. But I'm here for Christ. And you're there for Christ. It's all about Christ. Whether bound or free. Whether in prison or at home. Don't ever forget God is sovereign. We must never forget. God is sovereign. What a difference that truth makes in our lives. And of course he mentions Timothy. His most faithful co-laborer. Who was also with them in Ephesus. Whom Philemon would have known. Then he lists all that he's writing to. The first in the list is Philemon because he's the main one that he's writing the letter to. But he's not the only one that the letter is addressed to. This is a personal letter from Paul to Philemon. But it's also a public letter to be read by others. And to be read by the whole church. See this private matter was not so private. For the restoration and forgiveness of Onesimus was a matter that concerned the whole church. It's a very important matter. Reality of church, of real fellowship. We are a part of each other. 1 Corinthians 12.12 12 says, For just as, one, just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. And later in verses 26 and 27 it says, If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We are part of each other. Being united together as the body of Christ. The health of the whole body depends on the health of each of the individual parts. When you have a head cold, your whole body suffers. When you have a strong heart, your whole body is nourished. See, we're going to see later how Philemon was gifted in the church, demonstrating to us that each part of the body is important, even necessary for the health and strength of the whole. You, fulfilling your God-given gifts and responsibilities amongst us, brings us health. You, not fulfilling your God-given gifts and responsibility amongst us, brings us weakness and loss. From the Apostle Paul's perspective, how Philemon reconciled with Onesimus wasn't just a personal issue, but he rightly understood it, that it affected the whole church. Another reason this was a whole church issue was that with church leadership, there is always additional accountability. The church met in Philemon's house. There's no such thing as a, as a church building uh, up until the, the third century, over 200 years from this time. 
We talk about the church not being the building, but being the people, because that's the biblical truth. Well, I recently heard it put this way, and I thought it was very helpful. You could say that we are Poland Village Baptist Church that meets in the building at 79 Hill Drive. Our building's address is 79 Hill Drive, but it's only when we are here that the church is here. The church of Colossae met in Philemon's house. Philemon was a recognized leader in his church and with that always comes and rightly comes additional accountability. So the letter is written to Philemon and what most commentators consider his wife, Apphia, and his son, Archippus. Paul here describes Archippus as a fellow soldier. He's also mentioned at the end of uh, the letter to the Colossians in Colossians 4.17 where Paul says, And say to Archippus, See that you fulfill the ministry that you've received in the Lord. It seems like Archippus was now the pastor of the church in Colossae. The church in Colossae had sent its founding pastor, uh, Epaphras, to help Paul. So now the present pastor of the church was Archippus. Paul calls him a fellow soldier. We sometimes might shy away from the use of military terms to describe our service to Christ. For sure, a, a soldier is not the totality of what it means to be a follower of Christ. But it is an important reality that each of us in Christ needs to embrace. 2 Timothy 2, 3-4 says, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, but his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. As a good soldier of Christ, we must recognize the battles that we are in. We are, have battles with ourselves, with our own heart, our own flesh, our own desires for sin. In 1 Corinthians 9.27, Paul says that he disciplines his body to keep it under control. Must recognize the reality of the spiritual battle that we're in against wickedness. Ephesians 6, 10 and 11. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you'll be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We are called to be soldiers. Soldiers for Christ. To willfully follow the commands of our commander. The commander of the Lord's army. Perhaps you remember this little children's song. Right? I may never march in the infantry. Ride in the cavalry. Shoot the artillery. I may never fly o'er the enemy. But I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. Remember doing that? We taught our children, we taught them that being a soldier of Christ is part of the identity of being a follower of Christ. Well, I'm in the Lord's army. And folks, so are you. If you're a true follower of Christ, you are in the Lord's army. Well, as true followers of Christ, we are all soldiers in the Lord's army with a singular passion and focus and goal, Right? To please our commander. Is that your aim? As a soldier in the Lord's army? But Paul called Archippus a fellow soldier. And it means even more for Archippus. For Archippus is a pastor. And as a pastor of his flock. He's called to lead and to sacrifice. And to protect. To guard his flock. In the military. There is the point man. The man that takes the lead. That goes out before his men. Guiding and guarding the patrol. That's what Paul is reminding Archippus to do. As a fellow soldier. As he says in his parting words. To the elders and the pastors of the church in Ephesus. In Acts 20.28. 20, Be on guard. For yourself. And for all the flock. Among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To shepherd the church of God. Which he purchased with his own blood. I, Pastor Rob, every pastor you know covets your prayers, 
your encouragement, your support. As we strive to be good soldiers for Christ in our lives, and as we strive to be a good soldier for Christ, for his church, to guard and lead and sacrifice and protect. You see, Archippus is a fellow soldier. Verse 3 is Paul's standard greeting. It appears in all 13 of his letters. It combines two great truths, grace and peace. Grace always comes first. For we must first know the grace of God and from God. We must first have forgiveness and a new life by faith through grace. Then we can have peace from God and peace with God and the peace of God. The next four verses are some of the most positive and encouraging verses that Paul ever wrote. It shows the closeness of their friendship. It shows the closeness of their love for each other. It shows the power of positive and encouraging words. Paul could have went straight to the main point of his letter and start dealing with the issue of Onesimus. But instead, he first penned some very encouraging words to his friend. The issue of Onesimus is a big deal for the whole church. But it's not more important than the person who's receiving the letter. How often do we forget the person when we go to tackle the problem? Paul didn't. Paul took time to encourage his friend. It's a great example for us. Words are so powerful. Positive words are so powerful and encouraging. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. Proverbs 16, 24 says, gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the body. Proverbs 25, 11 says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. We all know that to be true. So when was the last time you purposefully encouraged someone with your words? Positive words give life. They bring sweetness to our souls. They bring health to our body. They are precious and valuable and vital. How much better would our lives be? How much better would our friendships be? How much better would our families be? How much better would our church be if we were quick to encourage with our words. To this day. The positive words. That Mr. Abramowitz spoke into my life. When I was a teenager. Are still giving me life. They're still sweetening my soul. They're still giving me a vibrancy. And a health. Folks don't. Hold back your words of encouragement. You, you never know. God just might use them. To take a kid. From the wrong side of the tracks. And inspire him. To become a pastor someday. Don't hold back. Your words of encouragement. Look there at verse 4. Paul writes. I thank my God always. When I remember you. In my prayers. Paul's heart overflowed. With thanksgiving to God. When he thought about his friend Philemon. His prayers for Philemon would always start off something like this. God, I thank you so much for Philemon. What powerful words of life and spiritual encouragement. Then in verse 5, he lists two specific things that he thanks God for, for Philemon. His love for all the saints and his faith in the Lord Jesus. The Greek word order in verse 5 is structured so that the first part of the verse actually goes with the last part of the verse. It seems like Paul was just eager to get out his first word of encouragement of the word love. Some translations even translate verse 5 this way saying, Because I hear of your love for all the saints and the faith that you have for the Lord Jesus. We must remember too that Paul's information about Philemon wasn't just from his own personal experience. Think about this now. But Epaphras was there. The founding pastor of the church that met in Philemon's house was with Paul. Onesimus was there. A very servant of Philemon was with Paul. These words of encouragement don't just reflect how Philemon treated Paul, but how he was with Epaphras. How he was with Onesimus too. 
Paul could so delight in Philemon because he was the same person with everyone. He treated the apostle and the servant with the same love. It's a great challenge for us. He was known as a man who loved the saints. He agaped his fellow Christians. It was a love of will and choice. It was a love of sacrifice and humility. It was a love that put others before himself. It was a love that was evident to all. And he was known as a man of sincere faith. A man of true trust in the Lord. Verse 5 literally describes the faith of Philemon as the faith that he continually had. That he constantly has towards the Lord. His faith wasn't an event in the past. His faith was a present reality. He lived out his faith every day, day by day. What a positive description of Philemon. Now imagine for a moment. Imagine you gather together three of your friends. One from work, one from home, one from the church. And they're talking about you. How would they describe you? What positive words would they use to describe you? Would love and faith top the list? Verse 6 can be a tricky verse to understand. The reason for that is one word. A Greek word that's really familiar to a lot of us. It's the word koinonia. Koinonia is an important word throughout the New Testament. It's usually translated as fellowship. It has the meaning of sharing and mutuality and community and joint participation. Koinonia in this verse is translated in very good Bible translations. In this verse it's translated as Fellowship, participation, partnership, sharing, and communication. Such diverse ways. This verse can be easily misunderstood. Because when we hear, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective. The first thing that would often come to our mind is evangelism. That Paul's talking about evangelism. May the sharing of your faith be effective. But this verse has absolutely nothing to do with evangelism. It's about fellowship of his faith. The whole point of the immediate context of this verse is about mutuality. The verse before mentions his love for all the saints. The verse after mentions his refreshment to the saints. The whole context is about Philemon's participation with his fellow believers. Paul is praying that he would experience the power and knowledge of all that Christ has for him in the fellowship of his faith with all the saints. See, faith in church just isn't an individual thing as we so often think of it, but faith is something that we share in common. Faith brings us together. We participate in our faith together. So let me coin a word and put it in this verse. I pray that your churching may become more effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. See, there's some power, there's some knowledge of all that Christ has for you that you can only learn through the fellowship of your faith in your church, through the mutual participation of your faith with the fellow believers. Only through churching. Think about the implications of that for your life. What power are you losing? What knowledge do you lack because your faith is not in a joint participation in the church? Are you missing out on some of the good things that God has for you in Christ that you only learn and experience through churching? Oh, beloved, the fellowship of our faith is so helpful as we love and serve and spur one another along. To a deep faith and obedience. Paul says he received much joy and comfort from his love. Because Philemon refreshes the hearts of the saints. He energized. He reinvigorated. He renewed the hearts of the saints. The word heart here is literally the word for our inward parts. Like our liver or our bowels. For us in our culture when we figuratively talk about the seed of our feelings. We talk about it coming from our hearts. That's why the translation has the word heart here. 
But in the biblical culture, they talked about their seat of their emotions being in their bowels, in their stomachs. So on Valentine's Day, to our loved ones, we'll give them a really nice card that says, I love you with all of my heart. Now if they had Valentine's Day back then, and they would give them a card, it would have said, I love you with all of my bowels. <laughs> and you know what? They, they mean the exact same thing. It's, it means the exact same thing. Now think about this amazing compliment from Paul to Philemon. He was a refresher. There are people in life that are not refreshers. That drain energy and you walk away more tired or more exhausted. But not Philemon. He's a refresher of the saints. When you spent time with Philemon, you walked away encouraged and re-energized and recharged. That was a spiritual gift. That was his great service to his church, to all the saints. Philemon was like those 90s Mentos candy commercials. Do you remember those? He was the fresh maker. That's Philemon. Now how many times when you come to church, what you first need in your heart isn't just another message from me, but what you really need is a Philemon, a fresh maker, to come alongside of you and in joy and in love, refresh your soul. If God has gifted you as a refresher of the saints, but you aren't churching, you aren't fellowshipping your faith, you're missing out on the great joy of your life to be used of God to help others. And the church is missing out on you and your gift. You see, you fulfilling your God-given gifts and responsibilities amongst us bring us all health. You not fulfilling your God-given gifts and responsibilities amongst us brings us weakness and loss. What is your joint participation in the church? What is your fellowship? What is your koinonia? What is God given to you? What gifts, what skills, what passion? And how are you using that to fulfill your part in his body, the church? Romans 12, 4 through 6 says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one in the body of Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. That's how that ends. Let us use them. Let us use them. There are many ways for you to use your gifts and abilities, your talents and your passions. Poland Village Baptist Church. And if you would like to explore, if you'd like to talk about it and pray with me about it, using your gifts and your skills and your passion in the church, come talk to me. Come Come see Pastor Rob. It would be our joy to serve you. So you can unleash your fellowshipping, your churching of faith in our church. Well, God designed his church for each individual to use their gifts and talents together. For each one, together and individually, to glorify Jesus Christ as his body, as he is our head. And may it be. Let's pray together. Father, now we come to you so thankful for big truths from little books. For Philemon and the example that he is to us, the challenge he is to us. We thank you for that. Lord, each one of us, you have gifted. You've given talents and passions, abilities. And Lord, you've done it with a purpose. You've done it to to glorify your son by equipping his church. Lord, we have a great church. And you're doing great things here. And we're so thankful for that. But Lord, we are ever pursuing a greater fellowship of our faith, a greater churching. And may it be to the glory of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.